brothers and sisters, we are so grateful again. Thank you uh, for worshiping with us again today. Listen, we are so excited about the worship and the word that's going to go forth today in our virtual worship. Listen, uh, before we get any further in our services, I want to make sure that we uh, make our guests feel welcome and also welcome those of us that are members of the well. Listen, it's fellowship time. If you're a guest, type the word guest and let us know where you are worshiping from. Also, if you are a member of the well, you know how we do it every single week online. We make sure we say good morning and speak to each other just to show some love uh, to one another. You may be the only kind of word somebody has heard today. So won't you go ahead. If you're a guest, type guest. Make sure we speak to our guest. Also, if you're a member of the well, make sure you speak to your other brothers and sisters. Go ahead and do that now. Come on. Go ahead. Go ahead and do that now. Go ahead. Let me speak. Good morning. Aim well. Good morning. All our guests. Come on. Let them know that Jesus in me loves the Jesus in you. Go ahead. Go ahead and do it online. Go ahead. Make sure y'all speak. Make sure y'all speak to all of our guests and all of your members and your church family. Go ahead. Let them know. Tell them we, we love you. Ain't nothing you can do about it. Go ahead and do that now. Yeah. Come on, come on, come on. Come on. Go ahead and go ahead and speak to him. Go ahead and say good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen, that's that's what I'm talking about. That's how we love at the well. Amen. Come on. Amen. Amen. Listen, listen. As you can tell, uh, we are, we're doing a, just a tad bit different today. Uh, as you can see, that these empty pews uh, have. I promise you, every time I come in and have to, we have to do a recording or do something, I promise you, it is the hardest thing in the world. Uh, that you all are not sitting uh, in these seats. Uh, but we are so grateful that though you're not sitting in these seats, you're still sitting in your seat on the virtual sanctuary, in the virtual sanctuary, and you have been a blessing and you continue to be a blessing to your church. So do me a favor. Do me a favor. If, if you are blessed, make sure you share this. Share this on your page so others can worship with you. Uh, don't don't let don't let don't let your family and friends not worship with you and receive what you know you get to receive every single week here at the well. Certainly, brothers and sisters, uh, we're continuing uh, during this pandemic, and uh, before we go any further uh, in our virtual service, we want to let let our family know, especially those that are working in the medical fields, uh, that we are praying for you. First of all, thank you. Uh, for how you continue to serve during this very, very tense and dangerous climate. Uh, you know, those of you that are frontline people, you frontline workers deserve so much more. We want you to know we're grateful for all of the nurses uh, that not only are part of our church, especially the ones that are part of our church, but the ones that work in our city and our nation. Uh, we'll let you know that we're praying for you. So thank you so much for continuing to serve to keep us all healthy and safe uh, during this pandemic. And so listen, we get ready to pray. Get ready to pray now. Get ready to pray now. Get ready to pray now. Listen, would you do, would you do me the favor and go ahead and say by faith, whatever your prayer request is, go ahead and make that known if you want to make that known so we can pray together as a family. But I want you, want you to put a comma behind it. You know what a comma means. Comma means that the sentence is not over yet. Comma means that, that, that this is one thing, but the comma means that there's something coming on the other side of it. Put a comma and said, things are going to get better. Whatever your prayer was, if you say, if my finances put comma, things are going to get better. If it's my family, comma, things are going to get better. If it's my job, things are going to get better. Y'all hear me? Go ahead and do that now. Go ahead and do that now. So praise him. Praise him. Praise Him, Jesus, 
Blessed Savior, He's worthy to be praised. We're going to say that again. To praise Him. Praise Him. Praise Him. Praise Him. Jesus, blessed Savior, He's worthy to be praised. From the rising of the sun, from the rising of the sun, you can sing at home. Unto the going down of the same, He's worthy. Jesus is worthy. He's worthy to be praised. Help us say, praise Him. Praise Him, praise Him, oh, praise Him, yes, Jesus, bless His Savior, He's worthy to be. to praise your name. Thank you, God, that you continue uh, to give us chance. Every ch time we wake up, we have another reason to give your name the praise. For your word says, let everything that has breath praise your name. And so, God, for the breath we have, we thank you and we praise you because every breath we take, every move we make, it's a move and a breath that we did not deserve. So thank you for all that you continue to do. Thank you for how you've kept us. Thank you for how you brought us. Thank you for how you continue to keep us afloat during this international pandemic. And God, that we do declare that while we are worshiping you virtually, that the virtual has not taken our passion and our fervor. God, we still give your name praise at home the same way we would if we were sitting in the sanctuary. And so, God, with, with, with uplifted hands, we thank you for all that you continue to do, all that you've been doing. God, all that you're going to do. And, God, we're declaring even now that whatever our prayer request may be, it may be our family, it may be our finances, it may be our job, maybe some other areas of our lives. But whatever it is, God, we put a comma behind that prayer request because we know that the prayer request, God, that we have we just going to come up and be something better than what it was. And God, we're claiming better right now. We're claiming better for our family. We're claiming better on our job, better for our personal lives. God, we are claiming better right now. It's already getting better. Things are going to turn around for our good. And we declare that even now that it's going to turn around for our good. 
And so, God, even now, we thank you, God, for how you continue uh, to keep us afloat during this season, during this season of virtual worship, God. And we thank you, God, that though, that though we're not in the sanctuary physically together, the same blood that, that, that saved us is the same blood that connects us virtually as a church family. And God, we give your name the praise for our church. We give your name the praise for our pastor. Thank you for blessing us with a pastor for nearly 45 years uh, who's been leading us. Thank you for Dr. Michael E. Jackson. Thank you for Barbara Jackson. Thank you for our first family, the leadership of our family. God, that you continue to allow us to serve this present age during these very critical times. God, you get the glory for whatever we say and do. It's in Jesus' name we do pray. Everybody say amen, amen. If you receive that, receive that, say amen. See, things are getting better. Things are getting better. Go ahead and say that with me. Go ahead and say, things are getting better. Ah, things are getting better. Things are getting better. Things are getting better. Go ahead and say that. I need you to type that like you believe it and say, things are getting better. I said, they are getting better. They are getting better. Listen, listen, family. Uh, we are so, again, grateful. You've already fellowshiped and prayed now. Uh, we're getting ready to go into the word of God. Uh, but let me say, let me say, uh, I miss you terribly, Angwell. Uh, we, I mean, I promise you, uh, I, there is no worship experience like the worship at the well. And so the fact that we have to do it virtually and I can't hear your voices, see your faces, uh, that we can worship together. This, it, it is a daily struggle for me, as well as Pastor Jackson, uh, that we cannot worship with you. But thank God for our virtual connection. And though we can't see each other uh, in person, but once a month in our cars, uh, thank God for virtual technology that allows us to still connect and worship virtually. And is there anybody here on the virtual line that can thank God, thank you, that we could still worship together? Amen. Uh, because you do know there are some churches that are not able to worship because they're not as fortunate as we are. And so, ain't well, we have a reason to be grateful for what God is doing and has done in our lives. Listen, we're getting ready, getting ready to uh, press our way, prepare our hearts for the word of God. Listen, I told you a couple weeks ago, uh, I have been blessed for, I've been preaching uh, now right at 15 years, about 11 or 12 of those years. Fortunately, I've been able to travel the country and preach uh, the word of God in various places around the country. And uh, I thank you, Amwell, for how even when the, when outside was open, uh, you allowed me, uh, with a little hassle, but you allowed me to go and still continue uh, to spread the word of God uh, as uh, God sees fit by building opportunities to me uh, and so I wanted to share uh, today just one of, one of my outings uh, with, with you today and I believe that this message is going to speak a word into your life and into your heart uh, listen uh, and I, as I told you last time and I'll say it again just in case you were wondering I promise you while I, I'm so grateful for the pastors around the country who have allowed me to come preach and share Look forward to doing this some more when uh, when it's safe to travel. Uh, but let me tell you, make no mistake about it. I get no greater joy than preaching here at 500 Earl Street. At 500 Earl Street. That is the that is the that is the address, right? Okay, good. All right. I had to look at Brother Mixon, make sure I had the address right. <laughs> but listen, we're gonna get ready to go into the Word of God. Uh, but listen, we can not get ready to do this. So listen, this message, I, was, I preached this message at the Orange Grove Missionary Baptist Church of Durham, North Carolina, uh, where a great pastor, Dr. Herbert Dickerson, is the pastor. I preached this word uh, to them. So I'm gonna, they're gonna, we're gonna go right into that message right now and share what God has to say. Listen, open your hearts and your minds and hear from the word of God. Would you grab somebody by the hand? You do understand that the fact that that hand that you're holding, that you can feel it, 
is a blessing. Because attached to that hand is a story that probably will go a little something like this. I've been through too much. Some stuff that could have made me crazy. But that hand would also tell you that because you feel me, that means that God knows how to keep me when I don't know how to keep myself. And sometimes we take for granted that people can be one situation away from giving up. So I want you to encourage the person sitting next to you. I want you to squeeze that hand just to remind them that while they've been through a lot, they're not alone. Squeeze that hand. One more time, just to remind them that this too shall pass. Squeeze that hand one more time. Just to remind them that whatever tried to kill them this year was unsuccessful. Our Father, our God, how we honor and how we bless you for this day. We thank you that through many dangers, tolls, and snares, we've come this far. Thank you for waking us up this morning. Thank you for starting us on our way. God, we even take time to thank you for the things that you did not allow to happen. Thank you for the car accident that didn't happen. Thank you for the house that didn't burn down. Thank you for the job we didn't lose. Thank you, God, that when we lost other things, you didn't let us lose our mind. Thank you for keeping us. Now, God, we come confessing that we've fallen short of your glory, for your word says all have sinned and come short of your glory. But, God, thank you for another chance. Thank you that you're not the God of a second chance because we messed that up years ago. But, God, thank you that you're the God that keeps giving chance after chance after chance after chance after chance after chance thank you that you're the god that keeps giving chances now god we say we need a word from you a word that challenges us a word that convicts us a word that ultimately helps us to change give us that word today i pray continually that the psalmist that you simply let the words of my mind and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight O lord my strength and my redeemer it's in jesus name we do pray everybody say amen if you love the Lord, would you put those hands together? Amen. Listen, while you're clapping, let's thank God for this wonderful pastor of yours. Come on, let's give God praise. Amen. And the only thing I would change uh, from what he said, he said we are friends. We are not friends. Uh, I have too much respect for you. To consider you my equal. My admiration for you, Pastor, is really at that high that I couldn't call you my friend. I can only call you a mentor. So I thank you for your ministry. Your pastor is silent, but he has so much strength. And uh, you know you're great when you don't have to be as loud as everybody else. But when you open up your mouth, that's when the devil in hell knows that you're a great man of God. Can you thank God for your leader? Amen. I really mean that, for real. Amen. I'm just grateful. We can't thank God for him and we don't thank God for his boo thing. Amen. Let's thank God for your first lady. Amen. We love her. God bless you. Amen. And so we're here just to celebrate with you all this weekend and 15 years in one place. Uh, most people don't stay on the job 10 years. Amen. Uh, but to be pastoring uh, black people. Amen. That's a miracle in itself. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So let's thank God one more time for your effective, spirit-led pastor. For real, thank you so much. Uh, grab your Bibles. Grab your Bibles. Thank God for this music ministry. It's been singing me happy all service long. Amen. I'm grateful to your youth pastor who's been assisting and hosting me, and I'm grateful for Mr. Sean Wilson. Thank God for him. I want to preach um, something that's not in the Palm Sunday theme, but I just want to be obedient. Is that all right? I want you to find Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1. I want to preach. God has 
laid on my heart earlier this week to share. Job chapter 1, verse number 20 and 21 says, Then Job arose, tore his robe, and shaved his head. And he fell down to the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb. And naked shall I return there. The Lord gave. I said the Lord gave. I said the Lord gave. And the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I want to preach from this thought very simply. God knows that you can handle it. If you would help me preach that and look at your neighbor because you haven't been talking about him and look at him and say, neighbor, God knows that you can handle it. That was the wrong neighbor. They didn't say it back right. Find somebody else and say, neighbor, neighbor, God knows that you can handle it. They're still asleep. Find one more neighbor. Put your preaching voice on and say, neighbor. Said, oh neighbor, God knows that you can handle it. If you receive that, put those hands together as you take your seats. God knows that you can handle it. Friends, I fancy myself as someone who likes to stay in shape, and so, Pastor, from time to time, I find myself in a gym. And um, I normally have to work out with a workout partner because I'm not motivated enough. Uh, don't look at me funny. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not motivated enough to work out by myself. Pastor, this, this, this workout partner, partnership that I have with my workout partner is very unique because uh, uh, sometimes I have to serve as what they call in the gym a spotter. A spotter is a person that when you're doing the bench press exercise, make sure that you don't drop the weight on yourself. And so, Pastor, I can remember uh, part of my job was to make sure that he didn't drop the weight. But also, when we were preparing in, in in-between sets, I had to make sure that the right amount of weight was put on each side of the bar. Now, I got to be honest with you, Pastor. This particular day, I was a little distracted. I was on my phone, and I was texting. And I made the mistake. Don't look at me funny. Some of y'all texting right now. And I said, I, I, I made the mistake, Pastor, of putting uh, 35 more pounds on one side than I did the other. Same thing my partner said. And so as he began, Pastor, to lift the weight, it was interesting because he was strong enough to lift it. But his biggest struggle was not lifting it, but his biggest struggle was balancing it. And just like that, I've already talk, I'm already talking to somebody in the room. Because if you're honest, that you're, you're lifting light, but your biggest struggle is not lifting. It's balancing. Because <laughs> it seems like on one side is light, <laughs> and the other side is heavy. I wish I had some help right there. It seems like that, that you can be, things can be all good on one side, but something in your family starts happening. And, 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 and he's struggling, and he's struggling. And I, and I began uh, to, to think about life in that way, that sometimes life has a way of being lopsided. Sometimes life has a way of uh, causing you of being a burden so much so that it's a struggle not to live it, but just to balance it. When I began to think about that, I started thinking about my own life. And I have a struggle sometimes, and if you're honest, you do too, have a struggle balancing life. And, and, and you know, when you're in that season where you're struggling to balance life, that's when you're introduced to what I call that one more thing season. That's when you say these words, if one more, I, I got some witnesses here, some one more thing happens to me, I'm, I'm, I'm going to lose it all. If, 
if that school calls me one more time about that child, I'm, I'm going, if that girl who I work with saw me speaking to her but didn't speak back to me, if one more thing, I wish I had some help right there, if one more thing happens. And, and that's when you find yourself in that particular season. And I was struggling with this. And God began to say to me, you ought to be glad that when I spot you in your life, that I don't spot like you spot. He said, because you put the wrong amount of weight on the bar. But when I am spotting my child, I know exactly how much weight my child could handle. And I'm wondering, is there anybody here around Orange Grove that can thank God that you serve a God who knows just how much you can handle? Well, Pastor, how does God know? How does God know how much we can handle? Because not every person can handle the same thing. I said, God, how do you know that? God arrested my attention this morning because I was getting my stuff ready as I was uh, for, the, for the gala tonight. And uh, I, I was ironing my shirt. And uh, my mama taught me when, when you iron your shirt, you have to make sure before you uh, start ironing the shirt, you have to look at the tag in the shirt. She said, because when you look at the tag in the shirt, that helps you preset the iron based upon what you know the shirt is already made out of. Can I tell you what God is up to in your life? God has a clear view of the tag of your life, and he already knows what you're made out of. He already knows what kind of fabric you make, and so you know and rest assured that God knows you can handle it because he knows what you're made out of. And when I thought about this particular fact, I was led to Job chapter 1. Job was a perfect and upright man. Job had it going on. Job had so much, so many great things going on. But brothers and sisters, Job's life teaches us this, that it does not take long nor does it take much for your season of prosperity to become a season of problem. My, if my grandmother were here, she would say this simply. She would say that times are filled with swift transitions. And, and if you will, Job, brothers and sisters, is struggling in this situation, and God sovereignly chooses him to go through this type of storm. What do you do when God seemingly chose you to go through what he wanted you to go through? And can I tell you, Job chose, God chose Job because he knew that it, while it may be tough on Job, while it may be rough on Job, he knew despite the tears that Job could handle it. But here is the question of contention for us to this morning. I want to wrestle with, Pastor. Here it is. What do you do when God knows you can handle it, but you don't think you can handle it? Can I get some witnesses in here? What, what do you do when God, when God knows that you can handle it, but, but you don't think you, you can handle it? Number one, if, you, if you're taking notes, you can start right here. God knows you can handle it means this for you, that God protects who he selects. God protects who he selects. What's interesting, Pastor, is that God chose this man who was perfect and upright, the Bible says. The Bible says he's the greatest man in that area. Now, what's interesting about this pastor, he literally subjects Job in chapter 1 with a series of attacks, a series of events. It seems like God uh, exposes him to repeated trouble after trouble after trouble. And my question is, God, why would you do that to Job? Why, why would you subject him to lose uh, not, not one of his kids, but all ten? Why would you choose Job? And, and he was the prosperous man, but everything he owned, he lost in one day. God, why would you choose that? And I began to think about that, Pastor. When I talk about how God sometimes will put us in thing after thing after thing. What, what, what do you do in that situation? Well, well Pastor, I, 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 unashamedly, I can admit to you, I grew up in the projects. And, uh, and, and when I grew up in the project, that was a thing that, that happened every, every few days in the projects. And, and it means uh, uh, the ice cream man, wish I had some help right there, would show up in the neighborhood. And, and when the ice cream man showed up in the neighborhood, you knew he was there because you heard that, that music. I wish I had some folk to act like you. Come on, y'all act like y'all know what you're talking about. And Pastor, I can remember because the ice cream truck 
music was playing, and all the kids started scattering because everybody wanted to get some from the ice cream man. I rushed in the house because I wanted that all-star bomb pop. Y'all know what I'm talking about. I, I, I wanted that all-star bomb pop. So, Pastor, I had a piggy bank that my grandmother purchased for me, and uh, it was the old school piggy bank that didn't have the thing at the bottom. And so what I had to do to get my money, it was 75 cents. I remember what I had to do. I had to take that, that piggy bank, flip it, and start shaking it. Now, when I shook it the first time, Pastor, a penny came out. I got to get the 75. I shook it again. A dime came out. Then another nickel. My nosy brother decided to come in the room and said, man, what you doing? I said, man, I'm trying to get 75 cents. He said, well, every time you shake it, what you need doesn't come out of it. He said, but you keep shaking it. He said, why do you keep shaking the piggy bank? I said, because I know what I put in it. And I'm going to shake it until I get out of it what I know I put it. Is there anybody here that can get that word today? That the reason why God keeps shaking you, the reason why God keeps taking you through what he's going through, because he knows what he put in you, and he's not going to stop shaking to you until he gets it out. Is there anybody here that can thank God that God must have something more in you because that's why he keeps shaking you? Yeah, that's, that's why he keeps shaking you. Uh, but pastor, not only does he select you in that way, uh, but the point says he protects who he selects because the author allows us to, 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 to eavesdrop on a conversation between God and the devil. And it goes a little something like this in the Trey on translation. God says, devil, what you been up to? He says, I've been walking around, chilling, you know, doing what I want to do, uh, uh, seeking who I can I can, I can attack and mess with. He, he said, have you considered my servant Job? God says, uh, yeah, 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 have you considered him? Satan said, now, nah, God, you know better. Because I, I, I have considered him, but you put a hedge of protection <laughs> around him. And see, I knew I was coming to preach for your pastor, and I knew he's an educated man, and I know he's a sophisticated man, so I had to do my homework on that word hedge there. And I've discovered that the hedge literally referred to a hedge bush. And this hedge bush was, was, was constructed in a way because every wise shepherd would plant around the places where his sheep would graze hedge bushes. Now, mother, this is how hedge bushes work. They were so tall that predators couldn't jump over it. So densely thick that predators couldn't run through it. And it was planted so low to the ground that predators couldn't crawl under it. I'm convinced that church folk don't know when to shout. Uh, it was so tall that they couldn't jump over it. So thick that they couldn't run through it. And so low that they couldn't crawl under it. Can I tell you that's the kind of protection that God gives to his children. That he makes sure that there is no possible way that the enemy, is there anybody here that can take about five seconds and thank God for his protection. That you're not here because you're so smart, but you got a God who has a hedge of protection that won't let your enemies get too close yeah yeah he uh, somebody here you you can say i'm still working on a job because he didn't let them get too close <laughs> yes sir ah uh, but pastor it's interesting because when i thought about this i i, I remember pastor when my my brother and my uncle who are the same age don't ask no questions uh they they, they were they were um <laughs> Uh, they are, and so they, they were the same age, and they would walk home to school together. I told y'all, don't judge my family. And so I, I, I uh, and when they would walk, bro, they would walk uh, uh, through, through the neighborhood. That was a neighborhood dog that was behind the fence, uh, behind the fence, behind the fence. Uh, he, he would always run to the gate, bark, foaming at the mouth, want to bite my brother and my uncle. And uh, every day, they ran. Now, uh, one day the owner was outside, and while the owner was outside, he saw them take off running. And uh, he said, stop running. They said, you must be crazy. Uh, don't, don't, don't you see the dog? And he said, yeah, I see the dog, but uh, you see that thing around his neck? That's called the leash. And the leash is attached to the chain. And I've already measured how far I want the dog <laughs> to go. Well, then my brother... What his smart self said, 
Well, what do you do if the chain breaks? He said, that's why I got a fence. Can I tell you something? You ought to thank God that your God will be a fence around you in every way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I've discovered, Pastor, that we've shouted too soon about the hedge. Uh, because we always shout on the fact that the hedge keeps the predator from us. But I've discovered that the hedge has a twofold purpose. Not only does it keep the predator from us, but it keeps us. Because the wise shepherd understands that sheep are not that smart. Sheep will confuse a wolf with another sheep. And so the wise shepherd understands that sometimes it's not just a matter of protecting the predator, protecting the sheep from the predator, but sometimes the sheep needs to be protected from himself. And I wish I had some real people in this house that you glad that you serve a God who knows how to protect you from you. Okay, y'all gonna act like that? Y'all gonna act like that? I got you. Uh, every now and then, Pastor, I'll be, I, I could be riding in the car with my mom, and uh, even if I had a seatbelt on, if she had to come to emergency stop, you know what my mama did? And, and, and I, one day I remember I was old enough and my, my mama, she put her hand on my chest when she came to us. I said, mama, what you doing? She said, baby, I'm trying to save you from hitting yourself. Yeah. Has God ever blocked you from you? You ought to be shouting that God didn't let you marry that fool. You ought to be shouting that God didn't let you take that job. Is there anybody here around Orange Grove that can take about five seconds and give God a praise for the... That he knows how to block you even from yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he, he protects you from you. Mm, somebody needs to praise God right there. <laughs> uh, that's why you lost the number, because he was protecting you. Okay, y'all ain't going to shout right there. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's why. Uh, y'all never caught up with each other because God didn't want y'all to be friends. You, <laughs> yeah, he, he protects. <laughs> uh, that's somebody's word. That's why y'all laughing. Some, uh, God protects who he uh, selects. But can, can I give you the second thing? The second thing is this, friends. Not only uh, does God know you can handle it because he protects who he selects, but secondly, God knows you can handle it because he trusts you to balance your own burdens. Uh, the text is very interesting because the text says that Job shaved his head, tore his clothes. This is an ancient Near Eastern custom. In that day, the way that it would display grief is that they would do these actions. So Job was in a complete state of grief. And that grief state teaches us this, that no matter how strong you think you are, no matter how much you love the Lord, life has a way. Of making you grieve. And can I tell you. It's okay to cry. Nudge your neighbor and say it's okay to cry. Life has a way of making you. <laughs> making you cry. But what's not okay. Is for you to remain. In that place of grief. Because you've got to have. A hotel mentality. When it comes to what you're going through. Because the hotel mentality say, I'll be here for a few days. But at some point, <laughs> I got to get on out of here. <laughs> and that has to be your attitude. Because in this text, Job made a decision at the, at the worst season of his life. That I cannot stay in my state of grief. But I've got to make a journey to my place of joy. Uh, it's, it's in the text. I, I'll give it to you. Um, it, it literally says, so then Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, semicolon, and fell down to the ground and worshiped. I'm reading too fast. Then Job arose, shaved his head, semicolon, fell down, and worshiped. I'm going to read it one more time. 
Then Job tore his robe, shaved his head, semicolon, fell down, and worshiped. Now, now I, I'm not as smart as your pastor, but I did pay attention one day in English class. And, and, and my teacher taught me that a semicolon separates two independent clauses in one sentence. And the way that semicolon worked, in the first part of the sentence, one thing could be going on. But on the back side of the sentence, a whole nother thing that contradicts what's going on in before it can be going on. But they put the semicolon there to balance the sentence but from the positive and the negative. Can I tell you what Job is up to? On this side of the semicolon, Job is crying. But on this side of the semicolon, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. On this side of the semicolon, Job is paranoid. But on this side, when peace like a river, I wish I had some help in here. On this side, Job is weeping. But on this side, Job is worshiping. On this side, Job is pouting. But on this side, Job Job is shouting and Job is trying to teach us that whenever you find yourself going through you got to learn how to live on the right side is there anybody here that can thank God that you just living on the right side if people only knew all the hell you've been catching it's not because you ain't going through nothing you just learned how to give God praise on the is there anybody here that can take about five seconds to give God a right side praise right there But can I tell you, that's what messes me up about church people, Pastor. Because the church people will see your shout on this side and try to tell you that it don't take all of that on this side, but they have no idea what you went through on the, I wish I had somebody in here. Shake somebody's hand and say, you can't judge my shout because you don't know what I've been going through. You can't judge my praise because you don't even know my problem. Is there anybody here that can praise God on the right side? I gotta quit. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm just living on the right side. <laughs> yeah, but here's the last thing, and I'll give it to you. Thank you, Pastor, for having me. And I'll see some of y'all at the next service. God knows you can handle it. Number three, because God knows you can handle losing things without Him losing you. Job loses all of his possessions. 500 yoke of oxen, 500 donkeys, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels. Loses all 10 of his children. And the text says something, Sean, that blesses me. Verse 21 says, and he said. I know that's so simple, you, you don't know that's a good place to shout. He lost everything that he ever had. I couldn't imagine burying one child, but he not only buried one, but he buried all ten. In verse 21, Job ain't silent. Job says, and he said. Which means this, that while he lost some things, he did not lose everything. Friends, I know you've lost some stuff in your life, but if you got up this morning and got yourself dressed, had your faculties to drive yourself here, can I tell you why you may have lost some things, but you ain't lost everything? Because the fact that you're still breathing says you're still here. Uh, Pastor, I, I was preaching in Macon. I was preaching in Macon uh, uh, in 20, 2014. I was preaching. And uh, as I was preaching, Pastor, church got hot. You know how church is sometimes. Church got hot and the Lord was moving. People were shouting. And in the middle of the shout, the people calmed down a little bit. A mother yelled out, screaming, and uh, she passed out. Uh, they, she never got back up. Uh, they had to bring the paramedics in the sanctuary uh, because the mother had a stroke. She had a stroke. And uh, they had to carry out on the gurney. I was sad. I didn't know. And so uh, I went back to the church almost a year to the day. And when I went there, I looked out in the audience, and you know who I saw? I saw mother. 
Now, mother wasn't in, in a wheelchair. Mother was standing, <laughs> praising God. Now, I just, I just had to talk to a pastor. So I went to her mother. I said, Mother, how you doing? She said, I said, it's good to see you. She said, baby, it's good to be seen and not viewed. <laughs> I said, I know that's right. <laughs> and she said, uh, it's good to be seen and not viewed. I said, I, said, well, I said, Mother, I said, how you doing? She said, well, baby, I came, and this is my first time back to church since my stroke. I said, well, shut your mouth. I said, for real? She said, yeah, this is my first Sunday. She said, I came today for, to see you, but I also came to testify. Now, Pastor, they gave me a copy of the program when I got in the pulpit. And I didn't see a testimony from Mother. And I'm trying to figure out, Orange Grove, when did she testify? I said, Mother, did they hand you the mic? I didn't see it. Did they, did they do it? She said, no, they didn't hand me no mic. I said, well, how did you testify? She said, well, baby, the fact that I showed up this day. That's my testimony. Can I tell you something? You ain't got to say nothing. Just show up. Just to remind the enemy that when you thought you were, I was down, you thought it was over, touch somebody and say, I'm still here. Yeah, I've got to get out of here. <laughs> and Job says, the Lord gives and he takes away. Bless it. <laughs> I've been trying to get here all service. Bless it. Be the name. <laughs> Of the Lord. <laughs> what, 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 what shouted me, Pastor? He's in chapter one. He doesn't get what God is going to give him back for another 30 to 40 chapters. But Job didn't wait to chapter 42 to start praising him. But Job learned how to shout in the middle of it. Because when you really, when God knows he can't, he can, he, he's not going to lose you. Because he knows that no matter what you go through, that you're still going to come to church. With tears in your eyes, you're still going to lift your hands and still declare that this is the day. That the, I wish I had some help in here. That the Lord has made and you're going to rejoice and be glad in it. Thank y'all, Orange Grove, for having me. Thank y'all for tolerating the light-skinned preacher. Listen, I got to get out of here. But Pastor... One of my favorite preachers, Dr. John Adolph, tells of a story. He told me of a story of how he was preaching at a real hot church. They were shouting everything, Pastor, and uh, they, they, they were shouting. So there was a mother, similar to the mother in my story, uh, she had a stroke. But mother, this mother was reduced to being in a wheelchair. She was in a wheelchair, and, and this was a shouting church, right? And so uh, the music started going, the organ started playing, and uh, everybody in the congregation started shouting. They had already put her in her selected seat. Uh, when they put her in the selected seat, Pastor, that was the usher who they stationed right by her just to make sure she needed, if she needed anything, she could have something. And so when church got, uh, got shouting and people started dancing, mother reached over to the usher, pulled on his jacket, and said, baby, he said, yes, ma'am. She said, eyes want to shout. Now he said, mother, how you going to shout? Now you you, you, your, your real right side is paralyzed. How, how, how are you going to shout, mother? She said, well, I'll, I'll show you, but you got to help me out of this chair. He helped out of the chair. She said, he said, well, mother, what you want me to do? How are you going to shout and you can't move your right side? She said, baby, I want you to hold my bad side. <laughs> and I'm going to shout with the one good side that I got left. <laughs> I've got to get out of here now. But is there anybody here? Is there anybody here that can give God praise? That you're not here in worship because you got two good sides. But you're here right now because you've learned how to give God praise with the one good side you got left. And is there anybody here? Is there anybody here that can give God praise? That the only reason why <laughs> you didn't lose your mind <laughs> is not because you ain't going through nothing, <laughs> but you've learned <laughs> how to praise God <laughs> with the one good side you got left. <laughs> can I get a witness in here? <laughs> and is there anybody here <laughs> that can say, despite what I'm going through, <laughs> this is the day <laughs> that the Lord has made. <laughs> I will. <laughs> 
rejoice and be glad in it. I'm starting to feel good here, Pastor. Shake somebody's hand for the next to the last time. I said, neighbor, I don't know what you're going through. I don't know who you are. But I can tell you one thing. If you can hold my hand, you can touch your hand. You're touching the hand of another miracle. Because I should be here right now. But the Lord has been keeping me. Go on and testify to your neighbor about all the things that the Lord has been doing in your life. Tell them how you lost your job, but you never missed a meal. Tell them how you lost some friends, but you didn't lose your mind. Because praise is what you do, even when you're going through. I vow to praise him through the good and the bad. I vow to praise him whether you're happy or whether you're sad. Is there anybody here? Is there anybody here that can give God praise? That praise is what you do. And after all that you've been through, you still, you still, you still got your joy. I've got to get out of here now. But grab somebody for the last time. As your neighbor, I believe. That church is over And I'll see y'all When I see you Peace But is there anybody here That can testify That God knows That you can handle it That's the reason why you didn't lose your mind Because God knows That you can handle it yeah. Shake somebody's hand I got to get out of here Shake somebody's hand and say, God knows that you can handle it. So don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. God is not through with you yet. Shake somebody's hand and say, don't give up. He's not through. Don't give in. He's not done. Don't give up because God knows how to keep you when you can't keep yourself. How do you know you can handle it? Because God has my life in his hand. Is there anybody here that can testify that you know that your life is in the Lord's hand? And since your life is in his hands, you need to use your hands and give God praise in here that your life is in his hands. Y'all got to, you got to excuse me, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean, I didn't mean to do that, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, because sometimes, Pastor, they forget that we go through stuff too. And sometimes we're preaching to y'all. Preaching to ourselves. The reality is, friends, God knows you can handle it. But the catch is, you got to make sure that your hand is in his hand. God bless you. We thank you again for worshiping with us today. If you were blessed by the word that just went forth, would you uh, let us know by saying, I was blessed today. I was blessed. I was blessed. I was blessed. But however um, you feel blessed, just let us know. Now listen, we're getting ready to go. Get ready to go. I want to pray before we get ready to go. Uh, because I believe these are sensitive times. I believe uh, that these are times where prayer needs to be something that is second nature for us. Uh, because of the world we're living in. And so listen friends, we're going to bow together. Then I got one important thing that I want to tell you about before we go. Uh, so if you would, bow your heads with me. Bow your heads with me. Bow your heads with me. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for how you sent your word to encourage us, uh, to impact us, and to help us. And God, we just thank you for the victory that we have in you. And even now, God, we know that holiday times are always tough for some, 
uh, but especially in 2020, it must be hard. So much loss have been uh, felt across the nation, across the world. And so we're praying as we carry the heaviness of the holidays to come. And so God, strengthen our hearts, help us to know uh, that whatever you allow us to come to, you can bring us through. And God, we give your name the praise and the glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you receive that prayer, say amen. Say amen. Say amen. Listen, we're getting ready to go, but I want to tell you, friends, uh, we are getting ready. Of course, you know, by now, we have been, we're literally seven, eight, nine months or so uh, into this pandemic. Uh, and because of that, uh, you already know that there are certain things uh, that we can't celebrate the same way because of the social distancing uh, things that are out now to keep us safe. So, of course, you know, we have a monthly drive-in service that allows us to worship as close as we could safely uh, in person. And so we normally, uh, at the latter part of November, we normally uh, will be celebrating our church anniversary. Uh, but because of the limitations of space and time, uh, we're going to push it back to the first Sunday of December. First Sunday of December for our next drive-in service. Uh, now, of course, you know this is weather permitted. Lord's willing, uh, if the weather is right and we can come out, uh, we'll come together first Sunday of December to celebrate our 134 year church anniversary. Somebody ought to be excited about that. Uh, we've been in service in the Mobile County area uh, for 134 years, and I can tell you this, we ain't tired yet. Uh, we're excited, and so of course, friends, we're getting ready for that, and of course, uh, also for our church anniversary, this will be a time for sacrificial giving, uh, that we will give sacrificially above uh, our tithes and our offers. And because of that, uh, because we know that there's a sensitive time, we normally do a certain a higher amount, but we're asking uh, for that if each member would please uh, sacrificially give uh, $134 just to commemorate the 134 years of church anniversary and service and celebration to the Mobile community. Now, of course, we understand that if you can, do not have that amount, get as close as you can. It's called sacrificial giving. Giving what you can from your heart. That's all sacrificial giving is. Giving what you can from your heart. And only you and God know what you have. And so don't feel pressured. This We understand that, that these are sensitive financial times for a lot of people, a lot of our family. So listen, do what you can but whatever you do, make sure you do it with the right heart and the mind. And it's called our sacrificial giving 134 uh, years. And so we want to commemorate that with an offering of $134 or as close as we can get it just to commemorate what God has allowed us to do in these 134 years. And I can tell you this, that the best is still yet to come for the Amwell Baptist Church. So listen, brothers and sisters, we're getting ready to go. I love you. I hope you were blessed by the worship today. Blessed by the word today. We love you. And in the words of our very own Lula Payne, there is nothing you can do about it. We love you. We'll see you. God bless you.